Good morning, and thank you for joining us. Dr. Walensky, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Nunez-Smith, and I will keep our comments brief this morning so we can get to your questions. I'll start with an update on our fight against the Delta variant. The Delta variant continues to drive a rise in cases, with cases concentrated in communities with lower vaccination rates. In the past week, Florida has had more COVID cases than all 30 states with the lowest case rates combined. And Florida and Texas alone have accounted for nearly 40% of new hospitalizations across the country. We all know that vaccinations are the very best line of defense against COVID and how we end this pandemic. That's why we've been tireless in our efforts to get more and more Americans vaccinated. For the first time since mid-June, we're averaging about a half million people getting newly vaccinated each and every day. And overall in the last week, 3.3 million Americans rolled up their sleeve to get their first shot. In the past month, we have doubled the average number of 12 to 17-year-olds getting newly vaccinated each day. Critical progress as millions of adolescents start heading back to school. Importantly, we're seeing the most significant vaccinations progress in states with the highest case rates. In fact, in the past month, we've nearly tripled the average number of shots each day in Arkansas and quadrupled in Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi. So we're getting more shots in arms in the places that need them the most. That's what it's gonna to take to end this pandemic. More vaccinations, more Americans doing their part and rolling up their sleeve. Over the past few weeks, we've seen strong actions from across the public and private sectors to help end the pandemic. The president recently announced vaccination requirements for all 4 million federal workers, and we're working to apply similar standards to all federal contractors. On Monday, the Department of Defense announced its plans to add COVID-19 vaccines to the list of vaccines required for more than 1.7 million active duty, reserve, and National Guard personnel. And just this morning, the Department of Veteran Affairs and the Department of Health and Human Services announced new requirements. All 350,000 VA healthcare personnel and all 25,000 HHS healthcare personnel must now be fully vaccinated. State and local governments, healthcare systems, businesses, small and large, universities and other institutions are also stepping up. Since last week, Washington State, Washington, D.C., and Seattle have all adopted vaccination requirements. And more than 50 health systems across the country have announced that all staff need to be vaccinated, bringing the total to more than 200 health systems. Just in the past 24 hours, Amtrak, McDonald's, NBC Universal, Discovery, and Capital One all announced new rules that workers must be vaccinated to return to the office. California announced all school teachers and staff in the state serving more than 6 million students will be required to be vaccinated or tested weekly. And the NEA and the AFT, two of the largest unions in the country, representing 5 million educators, child care workers and school staff, both came out in favor of school districts pursuing COVID-19 vaccination policies, including requirements for teachers and staff. And across the country, nearly 700 colleges and universities have announced vaccination requirements, which will cover roughly 5 million students getting ready to head back to school. So clearly, vaccination requirements are gaining momentum across the country and are already covering tens of millions of workers, educators, college and university students, and healthcare providers. They will help keep people and communities safe and help stop the spread of the virus. Here's the bottom line. 
Through vaccination requirements, employers have the power to help end the pandemic. As we drive progress on vaccinations, we are accelerating our efforts to help states respond to outbreaks caused by Delta. Our COVID-19 surge response teams have deployed more than 500 federal personnel, including hundreds of healthcare personnel in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Arizona to provide emergency medical care. CDC is on the ground in Tennessee, Illinois, and Missouri to help local outbreak investigation and vaccination efforts. We sent ambulances and paramedics to Missouri and Louisiana. And in Florida, we've stood up dozens of free testing sites and sent 200 ventilators to hospitals in the state. And importantly, as Dr. Nunez Smith will discuss, we sent five times as many life-saving therapeutics to states in July compared to June. I'll close with this. We are doing everything we can to get people vaccinated and support state and local leaders on the ground. But as we have said from the start, ending this pandemic requires every American doing their part. So please, if you're unvaccinated, get your shot. It's free, it's convenient, it works, and it's never been more important. With that, let me hand it over to Dr. Walensky. Thank you, Jeff. Good afternoon. Let's begin with an overview of the data. Yesterday, CDC reported 132,384 new cases of COVID-19. Our seven-day average is about 113,000 cases per day, and this represents an increase of nearly 24% from the prior seven-day average. The seven-day average of hospital admissions is at about 9,700 per day, an increase of about 31% from the prior seven-day period. And the seven-day average of daily deaths has also increased to 452 per day, an increase of 22% from the prior seven-day period. We continue to see cases, hospitalizations, and deaths increase across the country. And now over 90% of counties in the United States are experiencing substantial or high transmission. As we have been saying, by far, those at highest risk remain people who have not yet been vaccinated. This week, we are taking two important steps in encouraging and improving vaccine protection for Americans. First, for pregnant people who are at higher risk of severe illness from COVID-19, we are strengthening our guidance and recommending that all pregnant people or people thinking about becoming pregnant get vaccinated. We now have new data that reaffirm the safety of our vaccines for people who are pregnant, including those early in pregnancy and around the time of conception. These data build on previous evidence from three safety monitoring systems that did not find any safety concerns for pregnant people who were vaccinated late in pregnancy or for their babies. Now these new data found no increase in the risk for miscarriage among people who received an mRNA COVID-19 vaccine before 20 weeks of pregnancy. Clinicians have seen the number of pregnant people infected with COVID-19 rise in the past several weeks. The increased circulation of the highly contagious Delta variant, the general low vaccine uptake among pregnant people, and the increased risk of severe illness and pregnancy complications related to COVID-19 infection among pregnant people make vaccination for this population more urgent than ever. Second, I want to take a moment to discuss what we are doing to help increase protection against COVID-19 for certain individuals who are moderately and severely immune compromised. As we've been saying for weeks, emerging data show that certain people who are immune compromised, such as people who have had organ transplant and some cancer patients, may not have had an adequate immune response to just two doses of the COVID vaccine. To be clear, this is a very small population. We esti estimate it to be less than 3% of adults. We've been working to identify how best to provide increased protection to these vulnerable people who are disproportionately impacted by severe outcomes due to COVID-19. FDA is working with Pfizer and Moderna to allow boosters for these vulnerable people. 
An additional dose could help increase protection for these individuals, which is especially important as the Delta variant spreads. Following FDA's decision, CDC will hold a meeting of its advisory committee on immunization practices tomorrow to discuss this issue and offer their expert insights and recommendations. We look forward to that discussion and to helping support this vulnerable population. At this time, only certain immune compromised individuals may need an additional dose. Emerging data, including from a significant study published in the New England Journal of Medicine yesterday, show that an, there's an enhanced antibody response after an additional dose of an mRNA COVID-19 vaccine in some immunocompromised people. This action is about ensuring our most vulnerable who may need an additional dose to enhance their biological responses to the vaccines are better protected against COVID-19. The science and resulting data in this pandemic are moving extremely rapidly. The US government in turn is moving swiftly to analyze the science and make the recommendations most appropriate to protect Americans. We know our vaccines are safe and effective. And if you have not gotten a vaccine yet, please do so today. Thank you. I'll turn things over to Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much, Dr. Walensky. So it's becoming very clear now, if you go to the first slide, that we are dealing with a global outbreak of the Delta variant. I keep updating this slide. It now shows that at least 117 countries now have the Delta variant since it was first detected in June of 2020. So let's just review some of the aspects of Delta to help put it into the context of what we're talking about. We know the transmissibility that's greater than alpha variant at least two times as great. This makes a major difference in transmissibility. The viral load is up to a thousand times greater in the nasopharynx of people with Delta than alpha, which is a mechanistic reason why you have such a tremendous increase in transmissibility. Next slide. In previous uh, reviews before this group, I have shown this slide and checking the boxes as to the proof of protection against SARS-CoV-2 Delta variant. There was one glaring missing check in previous uh, iterations of this, and that was in the J&J &J clinical effectiveness. Next slide. I had showed you before this slide looking at data of immune responses in vitro. And this was the J&J &J vaccine study, which showed that it elicited durable antibody and cellular responses against Delta with minimal decreases for at least eight months after immunization. Next slide. We now have a slide that recently, uh, a study that recently came out from South Africa and other Southern African countries. It's called the Sasanki study involving about 478,000 healthcare workers. And this is real world effectiveness against Delta with a 91 to 96% protection against Delta and then 71% protection against hospitalization. And remember, I showed you before that the durability of the immune response is out to eight months. And this is the first real world data to show the effectiveness of J&J &J from this challenging epidemiological setting of Delta, particularly in the context of people who might have HIV. Next slide. Finally, if you look at breakthrough infections, which are inevitable with any vaccine because no vaccine is 100% effective. As you can see, as we've seen in other studies, the breakthrough infections, namely infections that occur in the setting of full vaccination, were mild in 96%, moderate in 3%, severe in less than 0.05%, with death in less than 0.05%. So I'll stop there and hand it over to Marcella Nunes-Smith. Thank you so much, Dr. Fauci, uh, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, today, I'll just take a, a couple moments. I want to update you on vaccination equity, as well as on the importance of COVID-19 therapies. Um, so first, when it comes to vaccinations and equity, important to note that the majority of people who are getting vaccinated through the direct federal programs are self-identifying as people of color. So that's through community health centers, through dialysis centers, and at our federal retail pharmacy partners. 
since President Biden made all adults in the U.S. eligible for vaccine on April 19th, the majority of individuals receiving vaccines have identified as people of color. So that is notable progress, but it does not change the fact, as we've been discussing, that there is, of course, still more work to do. And the work in this phase of the vaccination campaign remains hyperlocal. And that's why the Biden-Harris administration will continue to work just hand in hand with states and territories, tribes, cities, always centering our partnerships with faith-based and community-based organizations, supporting that trusted outreach work that needs to be done. I just wanna provide a couple examples of the administration's resource commitment to engage partnership. You know, in June and July, the federal administration awarded over $240 million to support community-based workers, community-based efforts, really expanding local tailored opportunity to build both vaccine confidence and vaccine access. This past week, the CDC officially launched the Partnering for Vaccine Equity program. That's an investment of $120 million in grants that have been awarded. Uh, and later this week, $20 million will be distributed specifically to Native Hawaiian communities. And in meeting people where they are, partnership is so powerful. And many of the incredible partners doing this work are health centers. Um, this is National Health Center Week. And on behalf of the administration, I want to say thank you to health centers across the country. Your commitment, your dedication, reaching underserved groups, health centers on that front line in vaccine administration, in testing, and in the administration of safe, effective therapies. As Jeff mentioned earlier, these therapies do include monoclonal antibodies. And I wanna talk a minute about those, but to people across the country, let me just reiterate, the best strategy to remain protected from the worst of COVID-19 is to get fully vaccinated. But if you get COVID-19 and you're at high risk, I wanna assure you about these therapies. You know, monoclonal antibodies work. They are safe, they're free, they keep people out of the hospital and help keep them alive. And our surge teams have been working closely with states, increasing access, provider uptake, and patient confidence. Uh, we've conducted virtual trainings for physicians and health system officials. And this has been you know, in Arizona, Nevada, Utah, Wyoming, with more to come in Alabama and elsewhere. Uh, and in fact, in Arizona, we have a federal clinical team on the ground now hoping to set up and run two sites to provide these treatments. And those efforts are paying off. Now of the COVID positive patients, the Arizona, the Arizona team has treated so far, not one has required hospitalization after that treatment. And we can also report that we've surged shipments to the states with the highest rates of community transmission. For example, Florida shipments increased over eightfold over the past month. And in July, more than 108,000 treatments were shipped all over the country by the federal government. And as Jeff mentioned, this represents more than a five-fold increase nationally from June. Over the course of the entire pandemic, more than 600,000 patients across the country have received monoclonal antibody treatments. That's hospitalizations averted and lives saved. So the Biden Harris administration continues to stand ready to assist states and territories and jurisdictions across the country to get more people connected to testing, to treatment, and absolutely to vaccination. So thank you so much. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Jeff. Okay, well, thank you, doctors. Um, let's open it up for questions. First question. Sabrina Siddiqui at the Wall Street Journal. Yes, hi, thank you so much as always for doing the briefing. Um, we're seeing a rising number of children being infected with COVID-19. So I have a twofold question. Is there data to suggest that the Delta variant is more virulent in children? And given that increase, are you still confident that schools can fully reopen for in-person instruction or are you considering further changes to the guidelines? Let's start with Dr. Fauci on the first part of the question and then Dr. Walensky on the school openings. Dr. Fauci. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Well, in answer to the first part of your question, um, there's no doubt that there are more children getting infected. As I mentioned in one of my slides, the Delta variant is much more highly transmissible than was Alpha. So given that, you'll see more children likely get infected. And since you have a certain percentage of children, even though the percentage is small, certain percentage of children will require hospitalization. So quantitatively, 
you will see more children in the hospital. Regarding the severity of illness, there was a um, couple of studies, mostly international, which suggested that Delta was more severe in adults, namely causing more relative percentage of hospitalization and more severe disease. With regard to children, this could possibly be the case, but we are not seeing this in a definitive way. The only thing we know for sure is that more infections mean more children will be in the hospital. With regard to the school part about that, I think we'll go back to Dr. Walensky. Thank you, Dr. Fauci. Thank you, Sabrina, for that question. What we know is that um, where we have higher rates of, uh, of uh, infection among children is where we have lower rates of vaccination um, in general, higher rates of community transmission. Um, we do know how to keep our children safe. We know how to do so in schools. And we know that most of the infections that is coming in through into schools is coming from high rates of disease in the community. So best way to keep our schools safe, and we know how to do it, is to um, vaccinate everyone who can be vaccinated, vaccinate family members if children cannot yet be vaccinated, and then to follow the, uh, the mitigation strategies in our school um, guidance, including masking in schools. One thing I'd add there is, Due to the passage of the American Rescue Plan several months ago, all schools have the resources to implement those mitigation strategies. Next question. Josh Wingrove at Bloomberg. Hi, thank you. Can you give us an update on the plan to start shipping those 500 million Pfizer doses that was uh, meant to commence this month? Has that started? And what kind of pace will we see in the coming weeks? Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Uh, the 500 million Pfizer doses that were announced uh, uh, in June to be donated to the world, uh, those shipments do begin this month, uh, and we will ship a total of 200 million by the end of this year, uh, this calendar year, with the remaining 300 million shipped no later uh, than the first half of 2022. So everything is on schedule there, Josh, and shipments are beginning in the next several days. Next question. Next question. Let's go to Weejad at CBS. Thanks, Kevin, and thanks for taking my question. Um, I have a quick follow-up on Sabrina's. Um, what is the latest data about children and long-haul um, symptoms after they recover, even from mild cases? And then, Jeff, for you, now that more entities are requiring vaccines, is the administration reconsidering something like a QR code or a passport to help verify people's vaccination status? And if not, what are you doing to stop the proliferation of fake vaccine cards? Thank you. Okay, Dr. Walensky on the children long COVID question. Right, thank you for that question. We are examining long COVID um, in children and um, we are seeing long COVID symptoms, mostly fatigue and headache. They appear to be happening at rates that are lower than they are in adults in the two to 3%. But of course, data with Delta and long COVID will need to be followed um, differently and, and longitudinally as we have been with Alpha. So more data to follow on that. You know, on to uh vaccination verification. There are a number of ways people can demonstrate their vaccination status. Uh, companies and organizations and the federal government are taking different approaches. And, you know, we applaud uh, this innovation. There will be no uh, federal vaccination database. As with all other vaccines, the information gets held at the state and local level. Um, but any system that is developed uh, in the private sector or elsewhere must meet key standards, including affordability, being available both digitally and on paper, and importantly, protecting people's privacy and security. Uh, the second part of your question, you know, we are aware of some cases of fraud or counterfeit COVID-19 cards uh, being advertised on social media sites, and e-commerce platforms, while the practice is not widespread, you know, I will remind everyone that it's a crime uh, and the Office of the Inspector General, the Department of Health and Human Services is investigating these schemes. Next question. Cheyenne Haslett at ABC News. 
Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, I want to follow up on a question from last week about the hospitalization rates for unvaccinated uh, versus vaccinated people. Uh, CDC has been saying it's 97% of people winding up in the hospital who are unvaccinated. Has that number changed with Delta and do you have um, better numbers on the eff efficacy yet, Dr. Walensky? Thank you. That 97% was data from January through May, um, January, sorry, through June. Um, and of course, with more and more people being vaccinated and with the Delta variant, those numbers are fluid and we're continuing to evaluate those. Next question. Let's go to Kelly Leonhardt at Inside Health Policy. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, there have been reports from CDC that over a million people have already gotten unauthorized third doses of mRNA vaccines. Do you know if private insurances and Medicare are still covering the administration fee for these shots, even though they're not recommended currently? Dr. Walensky. Yeah, we are um, doing an evaluation of that just to make sure and understand, um, and, and we have the capacity to track this and to understand the practice. Um, many of these are occurring in the context of people who um, may believe they are merit another shot, may may be severely immunocompromised, and are doing so advance of our in advance of our recommendations. The one thing I want to highlight in the context of this is that um, it does undermine our ability to monitor safety in these contexts. So we are asking people to, um, to follow our guidance, to follow what ACIP will say and the FDA will say in the coming day, several days, and to um, follow recommendations so we can, um, we can follow safety signals here as well. Next question. Last question, let's go to Michael Ehrman at Reuters. Hi, Dr. Fauci said this morning uh, on an interview that, that uh, he believes boosters in general are, are, are inevitability. Um, I'm just wondering uh, how soon you expect that uh, you might make a decision on that and what sort of data are you looking for to, uh, to make that decision? Well, when I made that statement, it, it's a true statement that we believe sooner or later you will need a booster for durability of protection. Right now, you know, as, as we mentioned, we are evaluating this on a day by day, week by week, month by month basis, looking at any of a number of studies, both international and domestic studies. And as we've stated many times, right at this moment, apart from the immunocompromised, which was just discussed, we do not believe that others, elderly or non-elderly, who are not immunocompromised need a vaccine right at this moment. But this is a dynamic process and the data will be evaluated. The one thing we are doing is we are preparing for the eventuality of doing that. So if the data shows us that in fact we do need to do that, we'll be very ready to do it and do it expeditiously. Yeah, I'll just emphasize what Dr. Fauci ended with, which is if and when there's a decision uh, we are prepared, we have the supply, and people will be able to get a booster in a fast and efficient way, if and when the, the, the science dictates. Uh, thank you, and uh, look forward to seeing everybody at the next briefing.
Welcome everyone to our White House virtual town hall, primary care providers, health systems, and the next phase of the vaccination rollout. My name is Bashara Shukair, and I serve as the White House vaccinations coordinator. Sitting next to me in South Court studio here at the White House is the Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Vivek Murthy. And sitting on the screens here, we have Dr. Rochelle Walensky, Director of the CDC, Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith, Senior Advisor to the White House COVID Response Team on Equity, and Dr. Anthony Fauci, Director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And on the other screen, you'll see doctors and nurses from around the country who are joining us. On behalf of all of us from the Biden administration, I wanna take a moment to thank you for joining and thank you for all the tireless work over the course of this pandemic. As a family physician myself, I know firsthand how critical the role of providers is when it comes to getting more and more people vaccinated, particularly those who still have questions about the vaccine and are not 100% sure they want to get vaccinated. I have an enormous appreciation for your work and sacrifice. Providers have been and will continue to play an essential role in this vaccine rollout. You are the most trusted source of vaccine information for your patients and for your communities. And your offices are the most preferred location to get COVID vaccines. So today we're gonna to have five conversations um, on the role of primary care providers and health systems in the vaccination effort. First, Dr. Murthy on the role of primary care providers in vaccine education and countering misinformation. Second, Dr. Walensky on health systems and improving vaccine confidence and access. Third, Dr. Fauci on providers and increasing adolescent vaccination. Fourth, Dr. Nunez-Smith on providers and vaccine equity. And fifth, I'll be talking about the health department's role in ensuring that primary care offices have access to the vaccine. So with that, I'll turn over to the Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Vivek Murthy. Well, thank you so much, Bashara, for that kind introduction. And a big thank you to all of you who are joining us here today at the White House for this National Town Hall. My name is Vivek Murthy, and I have the privilege of serving as U.S. Surgeon General. And I want to echo uh, Bashara's thanks to each and every one of you primary care clinicians, health professionals, and health systems leaders, as well as our state and local health officials. All of you have played an extraordinarily important role in getting us to today. And as the country and as the world have battled COVID-19, I know that many of you have been on the front lines, in clinics, in hospitals, in health departments. I know that you've answered frantic patient calls when a COVID test came back positive. You've taken a hard look at the data and made tough decisions on behalf of your communities. Many of you have suited up in protective gear and PPE, sometimes not nearly enough of it, and have raced to save lives. And you did all of this knowing that at times you were putting yourself at risk, the risk of getting sick, of being flooded with angry calls and protests because of your decisions. And of course, there is a risk to your mental health and emotional well-being. But in the midst of all of this sorrow and fatigue, you've continued to show up day after day. And for that, for all that you have done to keep our nation safe, we owe you an immeasurable debt of gratitude for your sacrifice and your service. You've helped your patients, families, and entire communities navigate a year of extraordinary uncertainty uh, and very painful loss. But because of you, we now see signs of hope. Over 172 million people in our country have been vaccinated with at least one dose. And deaths from COVID-19 are at their lowest point since March 2020. We've come so far, but we've got more ground to cover if we want to vaccinate the millions more who need protection from COVID and its consequences. Now, to reach that goal, we know we need to work together. And that's why the government has been working to knock down these barriers for your patients and your communities. Uh, from free rides to the vaccination sites, to making it easier for employers to give their employees time off from work to get vaccinated, to also providing free childcare. All of this while continuing to spread the word that the COVID-19 vaccines are free to anyone, regardless of their insurance status. And there's more we wanna to do to support you, including sex steps taken by Medicare this week to increase financial support for COVID-19 vaccines that are administered at home. 
So today, we want to call upon one another uh, as clinicians to reaffirm our role in this final stretch of the pandemic. We want to ask, what can each of us do to help people get vaccinated? For some of us, that means calling your patients and asking them if they've been vaccinated and then helping answer questions they may have. Surveys tell us that one, eight in 10 adults turn to their doctors when deciding whether to get a COVID-19 vaccine. That means that your voice really does matter. For others of us, uh, getting involved may mean going to your community and speaking with your local school, with your faith community, or visiting your local YMCA or Boys and Girls Club to talk with parents and adolescents and community members about the vaccine. And for others of us, uh, getting involved may mean reaching out to your family and friends in order to empower people to make decisions that they feel comfortable with. So today, we're here to talk about all of that and more, to start a conversation, if you will, a broader movement in the weeks ahead that will lead up to what we hope uh, will be a resounding success on July 4th. But to be clear, this effort will continue well beyond that. Now, I'm so grateful to speak with all of you today because uh, not only do I think of you as colleagues, but I know that you are all part of a sacred lineage of healers, healers who for generations have stepped up to face the challenges that their communities have faced, from smallpox and yellow fever to polio and now COVID-19. And our purpose as healers has never been more clear. So with your partnership, I know that our country can emerge from this dark year. I know that we will find brighter days ahead. Thank you so much again for being with us. And it gives me great pleasure to start with our first panel. Uh, our first panel uh, is gonna focus on primary care providers. And I'm really, um, I'm really blessed to have the opportunity here to have three wonderful clinicians with us. Dr. Basim Khan, who's a primary care physician and executive director at Neighborhood Health uh, in Virginia. Dr. Kohar Jones, uh, who is a primary care physician in Chicago, who cares primarily uh, for the homeless. And Ms. Edie Pacheco-Galloway, uh, who provides care for patients primarily focused on cardiovascular health uh, in Tucson, Arizona. So to all of you, thank you so much. Uh, for joining us today. Kohar, Basim, Edi, I uh, really appreciate you being with us. I, I want to start, uh, let me start with, with Basim. And, um, you know, and I, I want to, you know, I've spoken to each of you and I know just how much you have to offer. And in the limited time we have, though, I want you to share some of the pearls uh, that you have gleaned from your own experience. And um, Dr. Khan, I'm hoping you can talk to us a bit about your own conversations with patients, as well as your efforts to reach out uh, to your panel of patients. Tell us what that experience has been like and what have you learned that you think would be helpful to clinicians listening today? Thank you so much, Dr. Murthy, for um, inviting all of us and for um, your efforts um, throughout this pandemic. Um, you know, for, for me as a primary care clinician at a community health center, um, one of the lessons that I've learned over the years, um, but especially when it comes to COVID vaccines, is not to make any assumptions about where our patients are, how much they know about the vaccine, what their opinions are about the vaccine, or their willingness um, to act upon the advice that we give them. And it's, it's, it's always great to have open-ended conversations um, where you try to learn where they're coming from and you try to listen so that then you can offer advice. Um, in terms of reaching out to um, our patient panel, you know, as, as many of the people joining us know, there's so many different ways to do that. Um, it's, you know, proactive outreach through text messaging, through letters, through phone calls, um, as well as taking every opportunity um, when a patient comes in the office to um, talk to them and engage with them about the vaccine. And probably the biggest lesson that I've learned there um, is the importance of motivating and engaging with our staff. Because like you mentioned so well, um, it's been a difficult few months for a lot of people in healthcare. There, um, there's a lot of burnout. We've called upon them to do so much. And now in primary care, we're doing that again um, by asking them to take such an active role in the vaccine effort. Um, there are no easy answers to this, but any thought or effort that can be given to motivate staff, to encourage them, to engage them, um, to elevate champions, um, and make them own the process 
And to recognize their hard work, I think, goes a long way because ultimately it's in all these one-on-one interactions where a difference is going to be made, and they have to be motivated to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's very helpful. And Dr. Jones, I want to bring you in here as well because I know when you and I spoke, that you mentioned a few things that really stuck in my head. One was the importance of planting seeds with patients, not necessarily knowing when those seeds will come to fruition, if you will. But I would love if you could talk a little bit about your experience planting some of those seeds in your conversations with patients. And then I'd also love for you to mention a little bit about some of the community work that you are both doing and that you've seen in schools that are examples of how doctors can help expand the vaccination effort in their communities. Um, so I make the COVID-19 vaccine question one of my routine primary care questions. Have you gotten the COVID vaccine yet? Yes. Thank you for taking care of yourself and the community. No. Why not? And just letting them answer why yes, why no, and being able to answer the questions and letting them know even if they don't get it that day, I'll keep on asking them. And they can, situations change and how they feel change and to create the expectation that the, there's an opportunity for choice anytime that they come in. So really emphasizing the possibility to choose. Um, I work with Heartland Alliance Health, which provides healthcare for the homeless. So we've had the opportunity to do really close work with the Chicago Department of Public Health, reaching participants where they're at in the shelters. Mary Tornabene has been, um, we have led the organization in coordinating nurse teams and community health worker teams to go into the shelters and to do it ahead of the actual vaccine event, to connect with the shelter leads and then connect with shelter participants, answering whatever questions they have with over a 50% uptake in the shelter participants, which is fantastic. Um, within the clinic, Melissa salgado Bellman has done an amazing job of supporting providers and uh, encouraging us to ask every participant and then I've seen in my son's preschool, the Kiva Schechter, the health committee with the pediatrician, Stana Shinazi and Alashiva Shanes, leading the health committee, holding vaccine town halls, answering uh, parent questions, and creating a norm of this is what we do to take care of each other so that we're able to continue to have our children in school and to maintain this community together. I mean, what you just mentioned is really powerful, and I want to underscore uh, two points. Uh, one is that what you're doing by asking every patient uh, is, is so important because success isn't necessarily somebody saying at the end of a conversation, okay, uh, I'll take the vaccine. It might be them starting the thought process. Uh, and I, I know that you and many other clinicians have had the experience of having that conversation, and then a week or two later, uh, the patient may contact you and say, okay, I, I decided to get vaccinated. Uh, so you just mm -hmm. never know when giving people permission to have that conversation, to think openly about the issue may end up uh, changing their mind later. Uh, I absolutely had that experience, which was so gratifying. Yeah. No, I don't want it. My family wants me to have it. And choosing not to have it, validating the choice, having them come back a month later for lab follow-up saying, I went. I got the Pfizer. I went the day after. I trust you. It was really exciting. That's amazing. That's so great to hear. And that's what can happen in clinics all across America uh, if we do this together. Uh, Ms. Galloway, I want to bring you in here as well, because I know that you have been doing uh, some really important work in Tucson, Arizona with the Medical Reserve Corps. And I'd love for if you could share a little bit about the MRC, what it is, what you're doing with the MRC, uh, and help people who may be listening around the country and thinking, hey, I'd like to do that too, how they can get in touch with their local MRC. So <clears throat> the Medical Reserve uh, Corps um, is an organization where you can uh, register your, um, uh, your name, your profession, and uh, be called to help in a state of emergency and situations. So um, I personally had uh, uh, signed up for med the Medical Reserve Corps uh, several years ago, but never had an opportunity to come in to uh, do anything with the Medical Reserve Corps. 
But uh, in Tucson, um, I signed myself up. I um, had signed up a couple of friends, nursing friends, and my sister, um, who has been um, kind of my tag team person. Um, we have signed up for several uh, clinics uh, throughout town. Uh, the Pima County Health Department um, is doing a fantastic job, Dr. Teresa Cullen.